located at the left side of your screen. If at any time you have a technical issue, you may contact me by typing your comment in the text box at the bottom of the window and clicking the conversation bubble next to it to send. At the end of the presentation, we will be taking questions from our audience, and at that time you can utilize the chat feature to ask your question. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Using the DuraCloud Service to Archive Content in Glacier. We're pleased to have with us Michelle Kimpton, the CEO of DuraSpace, Tim Harder, Business Development Manager for Amazon Web Services, and Bill Brannon, DuraCloud Architect. Thank you all for being here. I will turn it over to Michelle. Great. Thanks, Christy. And welcome, everyone, to the webinar today. Um, we're very excited to have Tim Harder with us from Amazon, who um, we hope uh, we know he's going to give a great presentation, but also wanted to have him here so that you could ask Amazon questions directly, um, which may be of interest to you after we finish our presentation today. We are also very excited to launch the integration of Glacier with our DuraCloud Archiving and Preservation Service. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about uh, DuraCloud because I'm assuming many of you on the call know what DuraCloud is. Um, we'll really focus on what is unique um, in the, with being integrated with Glacier, how it works in DuraCloud, and then discuss uh, next steps for those of you that might be interested in uh, using Glacier as part of the DuraCloud service, and then give you an opportunity to ask uh, questions about the integration about Glacier itself. So just very quickly, for those maybe not familiar with DuraCloud, uh, DuraCloud is an archiving and preservation service that runs in cloud infrastructure. Uh, it is also open source code, so it's available for organizations to download and use it on their own. We run it on, as a service, so uh, you basically upload your content to DuraCloud and you can do these with a number of um, ingest tools that we've developed that make it simple and easy. Once your content is in DuraCloud, you can then make the decision how many copies of content you want stored in cloud infrastructure. And the choices today are in Amazon, which is S3 and or Glacier, uh, San Diego Supercomputer Cloud, and Rackspace. So you can choose to have one or multiple copies in those cloud providers. We, the service DuraCloud provides, in addition to the simple ingest and allowing you to upload it to those multiple providers, is that we run uh, health checks on that content on a regular basis and provide you with a report um, that gives you the, the summary of the um, health check signatures and showing you that they matched or didn't match. Uh, we also allow uh, replication to multiple cloud providers and then we keep that content synchronized. So those are two of the key and basic services of DuraCloud. In addition to that, um, with any content item you put in DuraCloud, you can also make that content public or private. If you make it pri public, uh, you, there is a URL assigned to the content, which then allows you to share that content. Um, you can set up uh, you can set up spaces in DuraCloud with different permissions, so that you can give access at different levels to different users if you so would like to do so. And there's media streaming also built into DuraCloud. So if you have video files, you have the ability to, to stream those out and provide access to those files. So that's um, really a very quick summary of some of the capabilities. We have been in production for more than a year now. It's about a year and a half um, in full production. Before going into production, we were in a pilot phase for about seven or eight months with nine um, users during the pilot phase. Uh, but some of the stats to share in this first year and a half production is that we're storing 35 terabytes of data that is across roughly 25, a little more than 25 institutions. Um, we've actually cr uh, detected one corrupted file in that first year and a half, and we've replaced it with the copy and verified it through the manifest that we generate when we check the health of the content when we're uploading it. Um, up until that time, we had no corrupted files, so that's a part of the health checking process that we're, we're doing. We have 5.46 million items that are stored 
um, in DuraCloud and about six, over 60 identified file types. So just to give you some numbers in terms of where we are today in terms of volume and, and scale. Uh, many of the users come to us because they have stored content locally and they want to be able to execute a preservation strategy and they don't have the ability to do that easily because they don't either have the storage available or the technical resources um, to help them figure out how to get copies geographically dispersed and then how to manage those copies effectively so that they're synchronized and that they're um, all <clears throat> healthy. And so DuraCloud helps you do that without a lot of technical infrastructure and, and people in place by distributing the copies, making the manifest, making it easy to repair, repair or replace corrupted files, um, and then not having to make that upfront capital purchase for, for storage and equipment. You can really buy storage as you need it and scale up and scale down easily. So those are some of the benefits of, the, of working in the cloud and then um, the overlay of service that DuraCloud offers in addition to just having your stuff in the cloud space. So when we started to look at Glacier when it became available, um, the reason that we decided to go forward with this integration was what we were hearing from our users. So um, lots of times folks that we're working with uh, want a second online copy and so S3 provides a second online copy and that's attractive to folks. But when they're looking at making an additional copy to that first copy, uh, putting another online copy is expensive. And so many of our users were saying, well, we'd like to do a second copy, but we really want costs comparable to tape. And um, there was no way to do that for us easily when all of our stuff was in the cloud. Um, they also wanted to be able to have a very cheap second copy, but be able to audit it. So they didn't need to check the health of every single item in that second or third copy, but they wanted to be able to audit um, the content so that they knew that um, through at least audit standards that the content was still healthy. They wanted to be able to retrieve it in the case that they lost both online copies in a disaster recovery scenario. So really minimal chance that they would need to retrieve the whole copy, but they wanted to know that they could retrieve it reliably um, and they wouldn't lose their shirts doing so in terms of the cost. They wanted to be able to predict what the cost would be. Uh, we've had many partners call us and wanting to archive large amounts of data in the 50 to 100 plus terabytes. And for those folks, um, putting the stuff in S3 was not a cost effective option for them. So they wanted to be able to put it in a lower cost, but yet have that simplicity of working through the DuraCloud um, software and also being able to get some of the services that DuraCloud provided. And lastly, really a very simple and easy to use um, platform in order to ingest their content, view their content, and uh, check the health of their content through the services offered. So that's at a very high level, some of the things users were telling us that they wanted, um, you know, as in addition to what was currently being offered in DuraCloud. So we kind of stacked up these needs to what uh, Glacier could offer. And we felt that, you know, it could certainly offer the low cost, um, easy access, and it was very easy for us to integrate with Glacier because we were already running the platform on Amazon and had an S3 connection. So some of the unique benefits of the DuraCloud Glacier offering um, compared to just Glacier Solo is that uh, content that's stored in DuraCloud can be automatically backed up to Glacier and it can be synchronized. So um, that synchronization is a nice feature. Uh, something DuraCloud does is every time content is uploaded into DuraCloud, we create a manifest. So we check the health, um, and then we create a manifest uh, based on what the digital signature is, and then we use that to, as a reference to continually check the health of the content. So that happens um, for the content that is also stored in Glacier in terms of having that initial health check. Um, through DuraCloud, you can view the content in S3, you can view the content in Glacier, you can view the content in SDSC. So it's just one 
one platform that you have access to all your content, no matter where it's stored. Duraspace provides one invoice and one service agreement. So this is something many of our partners have told us is a big benefit that they're not signing a contract with Amazon. They have somebody they can talk to um, and understand at a more transparent level what's going on. They can sign an annual invoice and a service agreement with Duraspace. Many institutions can't sign a service agreement with Amazon, so it kind of gets them over that hump. Um, so that's definitely a, a, a differentiator. And, you know, obviously DuraCloud um, has the health checking service. Now with Glacier, we would not be able, for cost reasons, to pull all the Glacier content and check the health. However, uh, we do plan on doing periodic health checks through audits. So that's something that we can do and compare it to the initial reference manifest um, and then compare it to the content you might have in other uh, storage providers in DuraCloud. So again, a uh, differentiator just putting it in Glacier Solo. And in terms of costs, uh, you guys are probably familiar with this, but Glacier is you know, roughly a tenth of the cost of what S3 is. So instead of paying, um, although Amazon keeps lowering their costs, but instead of paying a thousand dollars a terabyte per year, Glacier is $120 per terabyte per year. So rounded, it's a, it's a tenth of the cost. Um, what we are charging with, if you store the stuff in Glacier via DuraCloud, is we're charging you a 10% premium. So if it's um, $120 per terabyte in Glacier, uh, outside of DuraCloud, if you use DuraCloud service, it is uh, 120 plus 10%, and I think that comes to $135 per terabyte per year. Uh, so it's 10%, which is basically the you know what comes back to to DuraSpace in terms of managing the service. The retrieval cost uh, is today very very difficult to calculate as Amazon has set it up. So it's driven by the amount of content that you download, which is the data transfer rate, and then the rate at which you retrieve the content over time. And um, it is um, it's maybe not that hard to predict if you know all the variables, but it's something that makes a lot of people really nervous because they don't want to be downloading content and then get stuck with this really large bill. So one of the things that we're doing when we launch a service is to work with our users when they want to retrieve content to calculate what the cost is going to be and then provide them a static uh, quote estimate or what have you on what that cost will be and work through the use case um, because you can actually significant, significantly lower the cost of retrieval uh, if you know what the parameters are and if you have enough time built in to retrieve your content. But it's very difficult to, to understand, particularly if you're not doing it all the time. Um, in uh, Glacier, just like the rest of the offerings in DuraCloud, you pay for the storage up front. Um, it is uh, annual invoice, and the minimum purchase is a ter one terabyte, and it, the increments are one terabyte as well. And that's no different than um, how we operate DuraCloud across uh, for all of the storage. So on the pricing page today, you can find um, for our different plans, uh, what the pricing would be for Glacier and today we are um, as we're launching this we're only offering Glacier as a secondary so what that means is if you upload your content into DuraCloud you put your primary copy in Amazon S3 and then you can make a secondary copy in Glacier so uh, Amazon S3 plus Glacier is um, is the preservation plus option uh, down the road, we are looking at offering a Glacier-only um, integration. So in other words, you wouldn't even have to put it into S3. You can upload content to DuraCloud and only choose Glacier. And we're looking at doing that by the end of the year. But we wanted to get some experience first with a uh, S3 Glacier offering uh, before we move to a Glacier-only offering. Okay, so... 
that is what I'm going to cover, and now I'm going to pass on to Bill, who will talk more about the technical aspects of the integration and workflow. Thank you, Michelle. So Michelle has given you uh, some of the motivations of uh, why we have chosen to integrate DuraCloud with uh, Glacier. So I'm going to walk through a bit of uh, what the Glacier uh, integration in DuraCloud looks like and how it works. So as Michelle mentioned, DuraCloud has a, a set of secondary storage providers that are available, uh, Rackspace, SDSC, and now Glacier. So in the picture here, you can see that we can have all of those uh, configured into a DuraCloud instance all at once, or you, know, you can pick and choose which uh, secondary provider you would prefer to have your data uh, put into. And also, as Michelle noted, we currently are requiring that all of your content be put into Amazon S3 as a primary, and then into uh, Glacier or SDSC or Rackspace as a secondary. So the, the, the Glacier integration for, um, for DuraCloud works the same as the SDSC or Rackspace integrations in that you can see a list of all your files and you're able to select any file and see its properties, its checksum, that kind of information. But the difference is that you cannot immediately download any of the files that are in the Glacier um, storage provider, as Michelle mentioned, that will require a conversation with us in order to uh, get those content items out and make them available for download. So as a starting point, getting your content into Glacier, this is really the same process as you would use uh, to get content into any other secondary provider through DuraCloud. In fact, um, it is the same as getting it into a primary provider through DuraCloud. You can use any of the tooling that we provide, either the sync tool, uh, which has a graphical interface, it has a command line option. Uh, you can use the REST API or Java client to create your own custom uh, workflow to get content in. Any of these options allow you to you know, get your content from your local system into DuraCloud um, in whatever way you find to be the, the most efficient and the simplest. So once once your content is in the primary provider, and, and that's what uh, using the sync tool or the REST API or any you of know, these others, you're, you're moving your content into the primary provider. Once that's done, the DuraCloud automatically copies that content into Glacier, and it automatically keeps, uh, you know, as, as you move more data in it, uh, into S3, it automatically copies it and keeps it in sync with, with Glacier. So this is just a, a diagram that's perhaps a little hard to read, um, but it's intended to, to show what the ingest process looks like um, in terms of moving your file from your local system into DuraCloud when you have Glacier integrated. So the, on the far left, your, the file in your local system um, exists there, and, and you use the sync tool to transfer the file through DuraCloud and into S3, which is the which is the top um, uh, item on the on the far right. And as you transfer that file, uh, this the sync tool actually grabs the the properties of the file. So those are some of the the timestamps of what of the file as it existed on the local system and its its full path, as well as a calculated checksum, which gets wrapped around the file and, and included as properties when, when the file gets moved into S3. And then DuraCloud, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, copies that content once it's in S3 over to Glacier so that you have the same content in both places. Uh, what that white box is supposed to be showing is that as we move content into S3 and into Glacier, we are maintaining a manifest, which is which includes a the, the ID of the of the item being moved in, as well as the checksum and all the locations that uh, that content is stored. So we're actually uh, keeping a record of what the what the checksum was as the file was transferred in, so that we can uh, compare that to the checksum of the file 
later on when we want to verify that it is still what it was supposed to be. So once your, your files are stored in Glacier, you can, as I mentioned before, see them uh, just the same as you can any other content items that are in DuraCloud. And this picture here is just a screenshot of DuraCloud with the Amazon Glacier provider selected on the upper right hand corner there. And so you can see the list of spaces and spaces in DuraCloud are just containers of, of content. And that's on the far left. And in the center here, this is a, a set of just test items, uh, which are more mostly um, images, but some other uh, text files and such. And the one selected is the nasa.tiff. And you can see in the content detail on the right, some of the information that is captured. None of, none of this was added later. This was all captured by the sync tool um, as the file was transferred into, into uh, Glacier. And actually, this, all this information was captured as the content was, was uh, transferred into S3, and then it was copied over to Glacier. So this is what you get to see uh, about your files when, when they're stored in DuraCloud, um, regardless of the pro provider that they're in. So once they're in DuraCloud, uh, as Michelle mentioned, we have a verification process where we look at the files to, to ensure that they are correct. And uh, these are the kinds of things that we look at to, to verify that the content is um, what it should be. So we actually retrieve the content from S3 and look at um, the, the checksum of the file to re recalculate it. And, and we also grab the, from the properties that S3, S3 gives us we get the checksum that is available there. And we look at our manifest that we store when we uh, store the file uh, through your cloud um, initially. And we, we look at all, those, all three of those to verify that they all match. And then for any secondary providers, Glacier is the example here, we do essentially the same thing. Now, as Michelle mentioned, the Glacier integration is a, a bit different because we won't be grabbing each file to, to download it um, to calculate checksums just because uh, that is uh, not an efficient use of, uh, of the capacity of, for download that Glacier provides. So, but we, we are planning to do an audit. Uh, so uh, select a, a certain subset of the items to download and check. So once you have your content in Glacier, I guess the next question is, how do you get it out? And this is not quite as straightforward um, just because of the nature of how Glacier works. The expectation with Glacier is that content will be put in uh, for long periods of time without uh, needing to retrieve very much of it. Uh, and, and that shows through in, in the APIs and the capabilities of Glacier. So the way that we've worked it for worked it out for DuraCloud is um, in order to ensure that we keep to the lowest cost and still meet the needs of everyone storing content in, in DuraCloud, we're requiring that um, a support ticket be submitted in order to retrieve content. And then we will be in touch with you to um, really understand what it is that you know, the, the, the set of content that needs to be downloaded, understand the speed at which that content needs to be retrieved, and then de define from that the, um, the strategy for doing the retrievals from Glacier. So at that point, we do all the steps necessary to get the content back from Glacier into, into S3, which is the, the integration. And uh, at that point, you're able to download the files through DuraCloud just as you would any other provider. So moving forward, uh, that was sort of how things are integrated now. We are anticipating having a Glacier only uh, option for DuraCloud. So that would be Glacier as the primary provider in DuraCloud. So that option would not allow for any secondary providers uh, because we wouldn't be able to copy the content out in, uh, from Glacier uh, into a secondary provider. So that just doesn't make sense. Um, it's not listed here, but there also would be some limitations on 
uh, things like media streaming would not be possible uh, through Glacier. And there's you know, potentially some other limitations that we have not come upon yet. But really, the, the, the goal is to provide the lowest cost option possible. And we are shooting for the end of this year to have that complete. And we're working with Amazon currently to define uh, what the you know, what the best um, capabilities that we can provide in combination with with Glacier. We're also looking into ways to provide automated data retrievals. So without having to put in a a support ticket for us, what would be possible? And we really need to better understand the use cases that are um, going to be required before we can. Uh, uh, move forward with with that option. So that's what we'll be doing as we uh, you know, have more folks move into Glacier uh, over the next year, just trying to understand what it is that people need and, and how we could make it simpler for, for that transfer process to occur. So from here, I will hand it off to Tim Harder to talk more about uh, really just Glacier from an, Am from an Amazon perspective. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to first share with you our motivations for, for building and releasing Glacier. Uh, Amazon Web Services released Glacier in August of uh, 2012, uh, so it's been made publicly available for just a, a little over a year now. And what we're hearing from our existing S3 customer base which is very large now, uh, represents hundreds of thousands of end users across uh, 190 countries, uh, reflected in uh, more than uh, 350 uh, federal government institutions and more than 1,500 uh, education and university partners. That end user community on S3 is storing uh, over 2 trillion objects today and is running at a pace of more than 1 million uh, IOs per second. What, what the what the existing S3 customer constituency was was sharing with us was that they loved S3, both its performance and its its price offerings, but that there was a desire for a new, uh, reliable, extremely durable, but extremely inexpensive storage platform. That is. Uh, for data characteristics that would be written once and accessed very infrequently, and data sets that scale from uh, terabytes up to multi-petabytes in size. And the, the idea was really to, to bring the, the same level of durability, the same level of availability, and the same level of the same types of access mechanisms from the S3 heritage and deliver that in a new platform offering. The, the, really, the, the, the motivation here was to offer a new uh, storage service that end users could use for essentially cold archive, uh, for institutional and heritage archive, and do it in a price band that was, was very compelling. So what we, what we delivered on in August of 2012 uh, against those target goals was uh, being able to provide a very secure, very durable storage uh, uh, platform for, for archiving as, as well as for backup. We did it with a stated durability goal, stated durability uh, of 11 nines uh, for each individual saved object. And we did it at a rate of one penny per month per gigabyte. And in addition to the low cost and the durability options, which our existing customer constituency was asking for and the current Glacier constituency has, has told us is very interesting, this, there was a desire to make it extraordinarily flexible in terms of the capacity that could be ingested. That is, borrow from the cloud heritage of elasticity. Uh, allowing a, a given data set to be uh, ingested as, as rapidly as needed, used for whatever uh, useful life of that of that uh, particular asset, and be able to uh, you know consume and add additional capacity on an as needed basis. Uh, we we recognize that um, uh, security and durability are 
um, are, are closely intertwined and we have invested heavily, and I'll include them later here in just a few minutes, we've invested heavily in our security uh, program and specifically in our accreditation vehicles uh, that run the, the range of the gamut from uh, those interesting inside of the public sector as well as those interesting inside of the uh, commercial space. And you know the doing doing pieces of this can can be can be executed on inside of the classic uh, data center environment. What we wanted to do was make this simple and deliver it in a vehicle that was uh, uh, very cost effective to other market alternatives. And the, the the primary usage cases that were both design intent and that we see folks um, you know consuming Glacier for today. Are, are really around you know, three target three target areas. Uh, the, the first is for off-site off archive. This is for uh, institutions who desire to send both primary as well as secondary copies uh, off-site. Uh, those that are in a, a deep archive condition, infrequently accessed, and we see those uh, across both enterprise data sets, uh, media assets, uh, research and scientific data, as well as you know, a wide diverse range of um, uh, file types uh, that have been ingested into the platform. From a digital preservation perspective, um, you know, th this could be really any type of heritage archive content uh, that needs to be kept around for uh, a stated asset useful life or for a institution who desires to create a, um, a, a repository that can be easily globally accessed. And that's why we were so excited to see uh, DuraCloud's implementation, uh, DuraCloud's uh, added support for, for Glacier uh, with, with its very intuitive interface, but also with its ability to make uh, public data sets more easily available for downstream consumers. And not to be overlooked, for organizations who were going through a recapitalization process uh, had a either um, uh, performance desire or an availability desire or an economic desire to replace their tape infrastructures, the design intent, and what end users are telling us is that Glacier is uh, very cost competitive when being measured from a total cost of ownership perspective. That is, when, when factoring for not only just the media type, but the physical infrastructure, the property plant, and uh, the related items in order to keep it powered. Um, the, I, I offer here for, for just a, a, a quick comparison uh, Glacier versus some of the uh, uh, the other two object repositories that we make available uh, from from Amazon Web Services. Uh, you know, I, I think I think about data sets that need to be frequently accessed. That is uh, touched on a uh, on a regular basis, more than 10% of the time, uh, for either um, health check purposes, for either op operational restore purposes or for um, uh, dissemination purposes for, for downstream end users, our classic S3 offering will, re, will remain, I believe, uh, both a, a price leader as well as a performance leader for those types of usage cases. We have a offering that I think about as a, uh, as a subset of the capability, is really the full capability suite, but a subset of the durability statement from S3 that we call RRS, or Reduced Redundancy uh, Storage. S3 is designed to sustain um, a two data center outage condition before any type of availability or durability is impacted. RRS is designed to sustain a single data center outage, if you will, and Amazon Glacier borrows from the durability model of S3 uh, that it is designed to sustain a two data center outage uh, without impacting availability or durability to the end user community. And Glacier, specifically here in the context of both archive, backup, and DR, this is, this is uh, designed and oriented and most effective for data sets that are in a cold condition, infrequently accessed in a, in a best case scenario, and accessed less than 5% uh, on, a, on, a, on a monthly basis. I did want to give you just a, a quick snapshot of what uh, some, some current uh, users have been saying uh, about Glacier. And you, and you can read along here with the slide, but uh, Complete Genomics, along with their 
um, uh, large use uh, of other platform services, you know, has has really shared that uh, yeah, Amazon Glacier is both secure, scalable, and it's providing an effective, a cost-effective, long-term repository. That is, um, that Glacier is making usage cases like genomic sequencing and delivering patient care and protecting those uh, information assets to a very high fidelity um, in in the wild today. Uh, New York Public Radio uh, is has has gone through the uh, is going through the process of uh, preserving its master archives, that is, uh, original um, uh, original assets for long term preservation. And what New York Public Radio ha has told us and, and shared with the market is, you know, storing these core assets of traditional media on local disk or offsite tape expose them to uh, an increased risk posture and they're excited to be moving their archives to Glacier which they believe is providing you know a, a better long-term solution both from a protection and durability but also from a pricing standpoint. We're, we're often asked about uh, what level of services, what level of protection, what level of security across all of our, our platform offerings, uh, what level do, does, does Amazon, uh, 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 what level is Amazon responsible for and what, le what level is a you know, given end user or given partner, support, uh, partner responsible for. And I think about this as a shared responsibility model. That is, our, uh, through our Amazon Web Services property, we're, we're delivering um, the facilities very, a very robust uh, security posture along with the platform uh, options that you may very well be familiar with around compute, storage, networking, and a handful of uh, about 30 other services uh, today. Customers, that is, uh, given end users of the platform as well as, as partners who ha have built software offerings uh, leveraging uh, components or leveraging pieces of, of, of our infrastructure are, are in fact responsible for uh, the operating system delivering security and integrity at the application layer along with uh, what I think about as care and feeding for firewalls, security groups, and account management. And it's this combination of shared responsibility from us and from our partner community that has delivered and uh, that has allowed us to successfully deliver and complete uh, many of the, the highest acc accreditation postures. Um, and, and these are principally driven based on end user requests. So as, as communities of interest have told us that, um, for example, ITAR uh, is a requirement or that uh, FISMA is a requirement or that just or that just published uh, this week, SOC 3, uh, is, a, is a requirement. We, we've gone out and uh, committed the, the level of investment required in order to uh, deliver these to, um, uh, the, the, to, uh, to the market today. So I, I, in, in addition to uh, publishing the available reports and certifications, uh, I wanted to provide here just a, a quick link um, that, that provides just kind of a, a deeper dive into all of the certifications and accreditation packages uh, that we've made publicly available for our platform offerings. Um, in, in, in addition, uh, for an additional items around security and compliance, uh, we, we, we go, I, I think we do a reasonable, I think we do a very good job of um, uh, answering many of the baseline and advanced questions around both security and privacy. We've published this in a security white paper and published this uh, message and, and information around a security and compliance white paper. And, and, and I encourage uh, the, the, the motivated community to uh, consume this information and understand uh, you know, the, the level of investment that the business has, has made on, on, on your behalf here. I provided a, a quick link uh, to for, for additional detail uh, on this topic as well. Thanks, Tim. And um, I, yeah, uh, I, so I see a lot of questions going on in the chat, and I just want to let you know that um, we're at in the next couple minutes. We will actually go through every single question and answer them. So, um, so some of them that went by not answered, we will do that at the end of my few slides here. And even the ones that we have answered, we're going to go through it again just to make sure everybody benefits from um, 
all the chat going on. So put your questions in the chat knowing that they will be answered. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, so the next steps for Dura, Dura Space and Dura Cloud, um, we have currently made Glacier available as a secondary backup. So that means you've got to have your stuff in Dura Cloud and stored in S3. Glacier can be your secondary choice to all of our current and future Dura Cloud customers. Um, if you are interested in having a Glacier only choice, so this means you want to put your stuff in Dura Cloud, but you only want to store it in Glacier. We are working on having that available by the end of the year. Um, I have been working closely with Tim and his team. They have a team that actually works with the public and academic sector um, to really help them understand what the use cases are in the academic community. So they deal obviously with a lot of commercial and more and more government folks. Um, they aren't necessarily dealing with libraries and folks that are looking uh, to archive stuff with preservation services around it. So trying to help them understand that so that we can come up with the best um, offering really for this part of the community. And they've been very helpful and motivated to help us uh, do that and get to that point. So hopefully that when we offer Glacier only solution, um, we can take away, take out some of the fears of, well, will it cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars if I have to retrieve my stuff in a disaster scenario use case? So to, to figure out what's the best way to get um, the cost model uh, appropriate for the use case. Um, and if you are interested in having Glacier as a primary, I suggest that you sign up via the website to keep informed. And uh, for those that want to be part of the beta, um, we will be reaching out to people uh, at the end of the year for that. Uh, if you're interested in having Glacier as a secondary provider in Dura Cloud, that is available today. So you can sign up and that is available to you as we speak. Uh, to find out more, here's some references, the DuraCloud site, obviously, the wiki. We have done a number of YouTube webinars that show you how to use uh, DuraCloud and different aspects of DuraCloud. And of course, you can always email myself directly, Michelle Kimpton, or Carissa Smith, who is our partner specialist um, for DuraCloud. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Christy, I think, who's going to read through the questions, and then myself, Tim, or Bill will answer as appropriate. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So as Michelle mentioned, there was a lot of questions, some answers going through the chat window. What we would like to do at this time is start from the beginning and review your questions. If we don't cover the answer as fully as you, know, you wish, there is the slide right now to learn more. You can always contact the website or person on that slide, but we'll do our best to answer your question. So let's go ahead and begin with Steve's question. Do fixity checks, check some generation, count as retrieval of data from Glacier? So the answer to that question is yes, in order to get the content item out of Glacier, in order to be able to recalculate a checksum, it does require us to uh, you know, pull the file out of Glacier, which does count as part of the, um, the retrieval. Okay, thanks, Bill. Is Glacier based on tape, I'm going to say type, or, and or disk storage infrastructure? This is Tim Harder. We haven't publicly disclosed the media type that is being used for the platform, and in commonly across all of our services, it's uh, Amazon policy to uh, innovate on behalf of our customers and, and deliver platform services in, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a services vehicle and, and it allows us to continue to innovate and, and change and add additional features on an as-needed basis. Thank you, Tim. For fixity checks, what if Glacier content is transferred to an EC2 instance in the same region rather than transferred to the internet in general? Does the data transfer charges still apply? So that one is no. Data transfer does not apply, but the retrieval cost does apply. Okay. 
what are the specifics of the data, data retrieval policies? How much data, how rapidly supported by Glacier? So that's a bit complicated. There's a good bit of information on the uh, Glacier website about that information. Uh, just as a brief, there is a, a, a free allowance of 5% of your content in a month that's prorated daily that is uh, allowed for, for download at no cost. And once it moves beyond that, then the retrieval costs start to kick in and that's where it gets complicated. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'll just chime in here for a minute. When you're retrieving content from Glacier, there's two drivers of the cost. It's the data transfer out rate potentially and the retrieval cost. And data transfer out is pretty simple because it's reasonably static, depends on how much content you store, and it's roughly 10 to 12 cents a gigabyte. So you can kind of predict based on how much content you're going to download what that data transfer out cost is. The retrieval cost, however, is much more complex. You have a certain budget, 5% a month, that you get for free, but then your retrieval cost is based on how fast you need to down retrieve the data, and that cost can vary widely <laughs> depending on how much um, content you want to download in what period of time. So that's why DuraSpace, which is running DuraCloud and integrated now with uh, in, has Glacier as an option is providing support so that when you need to retrieve data we will calculate what those charges are going to be for you and have a discussion because it is very complex we feel this is Tim you know the our our intent was to present a, a sliding scale one that allowed uh, uh, users of the platform to uh, immediately extract data uh, and use it for you know additional computing purposes uh, but we also wanted to allow a mechanism that kept the you know total cost of storing the asset extremely low uh, and and for that there's a trade-off between uh, both latency uh, as well as um, the the pace or the, uh, the, uh, the the percentage of data rather that is uh, that is delivered and I think I think one of the very valuable steps that the DuraCloud, you know, has undertaken is really uh, become experts at understanding the, the the pricing model and that speed bump process or of offering, you know, a consultative discussion, you know, helps both, uh, you know, simplify our offering as well as, you know, make it very easy for, uh, you know, for for downstream end users of the platform to be able to, you know, get a get a very accurate look at what the you know, recovery, restoration, or data inspection event is going to is going to cause. Okay, and Lisa's asking for some clarification. Does Glacier do its own routine checksum checks? Uh, this is Tim. In order for us to uh, you know maintain the eleven nines of durability on the platform, there are you know extensive data protection uh, mechanisms that are in place. Um, however, the instrumentation for, for those types of facilities are not exposed um, uh, via the API set. Okay, and uh, Tim, I think this question goes right along with that. If there's an error found during an audit or a validity check, how does Glacier handle that? Probably outside of scope for this particular discussion, but what, what, I, would, what I would direct uh, the the, the question too, and this is something that I'm happy to, to dive deeper with in a in a one-on-one -on -one discussion, is that we have uh, create we've offered a stated SLA for the service. Um, it is uh, based on a uh, a very uh, highly distributed architecture, and in addition to the integrity mechanisms that we have implemented internally, uh, there are the the additional uh, features that. Uh, DuraCloud and DSpace is managed uh, externally, specifically around manifesting, specifically around being able to recover from any type of, you know, system system level event or from any type of, uh, you know, event that would have occurred during uh, during ingest. Okay. If an item's come, maybe I'll. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Sorry. Sorry, Christy. I'll just point out there, um, with regard to the the DuraCloud side of that, uh, certainly, uh, if 
if there are you know, content stored in multiple providers with, with DuraCloud, um, you, there is you know, the ability for DuraCloud to be able to handle that problem. That's one of the benefits of having, say, content in both S3 and Glacier or, you know, or another provider. Uh, of course, if, if it's only in Glacier, which you know, we're looking at, then um, we're pretty dependent on you know, what, what Glacier offers, which, which is pretty significant on its own, of course. Okay, and Bill, you can just stay on the mic here. Um, you did a great job answering this in the chat, but just for um, to reiterate, one of our questions was if an item's compromised or changed in your primary storage area, will it be propagated automatically to Glacier without notification? So the answer there is no, and the reason for that is because the automatic transfer of content is based on the the events that occur within the API of DuraCloud. So if if the API uh, event is to create a new new object or you know, store a new file, then that will get that file will get propagated um, to the multiple storage areas. But uh, we we don't look for uh, each individual item after it's been stored to, to see if it's been changed um, because we expect that it has not and and so that that would not get automatically replicated but we would pick it up as part of the bit integrity check okay and can you clarify the distinction between transfer out and retrieval sure with with regard to glacier the transfer out is the actual download of the file uh, to your local system. The retrieval is uh, essentially requesting that the data be made available from Glacier to be able to to perform that download. Okay, I'm not sure so if you have any clarify, further clarification, Tim. Ret the retrieval cost is unique to Glacier, if I'm not mistaken. Right, retrieval is, is consistent. Is, only for Glacier, the, the data transfer costs are consistent across Glacier and S3. Would it be appropriate to characterize Glacier primarily targeting the archiving needs of research in government organizations? Uh, this is Tim. I, I think a better characterization would be to state that Glacier is targeting um, cold archive workloads. Uh, across uh, multiple constituencies, those that include uh, the, the, the constituencies that were stated, but in addition to, you know, broadly the, the commercial sector as well. This is, a, this is a platform for many users with different levels of, of usage cases and, and certainly different levels of, of accreditation that are required. One of the recommendations we have from John is that a comprehensive health check of Glacier Holdings done periodically but infrequently would be very welcome. Could this be something that's offered for an additional cost? I'd say that's something we certainly could do. Uh, certainly it would take a while to, to cover, you know, to, to look at every content item, but it, you know, it's something we could do. I'd, I'd say that if this is something that's important, it would be, you know, really good to you know, be aware of that for, um, you know, for the way we we are you know, trying to build our offering going forward. So I think the the more we hear that, the the better we have an understanding that that's something that that is necessary, you know, beyond the audit that we're looking at now. And then to factor in, at least at this stage, what cost. Um, makes that even viable. Was the checksum error that you described at the beginning not picked up by the S3's self-healing fixity checking? I'll answer that. So the um, error, I didn't happen to say what cloud provider it was in, and I'm, I'm actually not going to say that because uh, that's kind of confidential information for the, the customer. But um, it wasn't picked up by any of the, the cloud providers. It was picked up through um, through the, the checking report that we did. Okay. Could there be a calculator that is integrated into DuraCloud that indicates anticipated retrieval costs per content item or space? Uh, 
with regard to any provider other than Glacier, that could be done. Um, I mean, certainly there are calculators for for doing Glacier as well, um, but they are you know, somewhat more complex, and I, I I'm not sure if we would be inclined to do that. Any I'll just chime in here as as well. Um, so Marcus, the reason that uh, before you can download content from Glacier that we're having you contact us is that we are going to do that calculation for you and then based on what we find out maybe we could develop a calculator down the road but we're not going to do that initially to make sure that nobody gets sticker shock um, if they have to download large amounts of content. So it's going to be a, a team process at least for the next uh, six months here. Okay, thank you. We've had some excellent questions and we still have um, one remaining one as well as a few minutes left. So if you have an outstanding question, please feel free to type it in the chat window at this time. And let's take our question from Chris. If we want to use Glacier as primary storage, which implies no secondary storage location for DuraCloud to keep in sync for us, what does buying the Glacier storage, sorry, my screen keeps moving. What does buying the Glacier storage through DuraCloud add over our buying Glacier storage directly from Amazon ourselves? I feel like it adds a couple of things. One is that you get to use the tooling that is provided with DuraCloud to get your content in. Um, and then also there is the support provided by DuraCloud in order to get your content out at a reasonable cost in the time frame that you need. And you have the, the web-based platform to, to view the content and manage the content, as well as one um, invoice annually from DuraSpace, which you can't get from Amazon. Okay. And the additional layer of audit checking. How does Glacier assign unique IDs to files? Um, DuraCloud, from what they understand, DuraCloud uses the original file path rather than a checksum. Will Glacier do the same? So underneath the covers, um, the way that uh, the DuraCloud integration with Glacier works is it's actually through S3. So we store the files in S3 using the, the ID provided you know, by, by DuraCloud, which as noted is the, um, the original file path. And then there is a process that occurs essentially under the covers with, within Amazon to copy that file from S3 on our request, you know, through our request um, into Glacier. So the actual IDs that are known about the file are actually the, the S3 IDs, which are the, the DuraCloud IDs. There are actually two different ways that you can can uh, get content into Glacier. That is either directly in into Glacier or through the S3 integration, and DuraCloud uses the S3 integration. Thanks, Bill. We'll wait. Does anyone have any final questions? We have one coming in. What about IDs for a Glacier standalone? Maybe I'll let Tim answer that one. I, I think that I'd ask for just a, a bit more clarification. Um, so maybe you could provide a, a little bit more color what you're describing there. So, you know, Glacier Glacier has the ability to be accessed programmatically, uh, which is what DuraCloud ha has implemented really a front end to our platform. We also expose a um, uh, a Glacier specific API, and that is built around uh, the constructs of what we call vaults. And inside of vaults, there are collections of archives. So think about these as two different ways of, of batching up content type to be you know, d delivered directly through the Glacier uh, API. Okay, thanks, Tim. 
I would like to thank Michelle, Bill, and Tim for today's presentation, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. We are interested in getting your thoughts, um, having your feedback regarding today's presentation. I just posted a link into the chat window, and we would appreciate if you took just a few minutes to answer quick four questions about today's presentation. This presentation has been recorded, and the recording as well as the presentation slides will be made available later this week, and we will email that information out to you. This concludes our session today. Thanks again for joining us, and enjoy the rest.